Well, hello and welcome, everybody. We're glad to have you along uh, on this uh, this episode of Toronto Apologetics. It's uh, good to uh, have you give up your afternoon. Maybe it's evening for some of you folks. Maybe you're joining us from the other side of the world. And if that's the case, well, good morning to you. So we're glad to, uh, to have you. And uh, today uh, we're going to be dealing with a very important topic. But before jumping in, I just want to say a little bit about uh, Toronto Apologetics and what Toronto Apologetics is about. Um, this uh, ministry is uh, is dedicated to the defense of the Christian faith, and uh, it's also a ministry in which we engage with uh, various worldviews and various uh, uh, various uh, worldviews that uh, attack the Christian faith, challenge the Christian faith, and so on. This program, we we deal with uh, some of those uh, critiques. We also deal with uh, political issues. We deal with issues dealing with other religions, whether it be Islam or Hinduism or Judaism, uh, Buddhism, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, we also deal with political issues, uh, political issues that uh, affect the church. And so uh, we're here, uh, as it were, to equip the church and to edify uh, Christians in their walk with Christ. And so today we are going to be dealing with uh, a very important uh, question and that is the question about uh, what do we do with um, those who doubt? Um, there have been some high-profile evangelicals who have, uh, as of late, uh, renounced publicly their Christian faith and uh, have walked away and, and have claimed that Christianity just wasn't their bag and that uh, Christianity really didn't uh, answer their, their deep-seated uh, questions and so um, I thought that I would bring on a, a, a dear brother and friend and colleague uh, onto the show who has been dealing with this particular area. And in fact, he has a ministry, uh, a website uh, dedicated to responding to uh, Christians who are having doubts and, and who are struggling with their faith. And so um, it gives me great pleasure to, to bring on my dear brother in Christ, uh, Dr. Jonathan McClatchy. Uh, Jonathan, it's so good to see you again, brother. So good to see you again, uh, uh, Tony, as well. Um, thanks so much for having me on. It's, uh, it's a pleasure, and uh, it's, it's been uh, long overdue. Uh, and so I'm so glad to have you on. So, Jonathan, can you maybe um, tell our viewers a little bit about your ministry and um, about what you do? Um, I, you, just like myself, you're involved in apologetics, and and you've also engaged uh, in debates with with various uh, with various people. Um, just recently, I understand you had a debate with Yusuf Ismail and Shabir Ali, where you and uh, Samuel Green uh, you had a tag debate uh, on Isaiah fifty three and the suffering servant. Uh, but maybe tell us a little bit about yourself so that our viewers uh, can become familiar with you and your work. Absolutely. So professionally, I have a scientific background. So I um, have a um, PhD in uh, molecular biology. I did my PhD dissertation on the evolution of the eukaryotic cell cycle uh, or the cell division cycle. Uh, I currently am employed at a Christian college in Boston, Massachusetts uh, called Sattler College. Uh, we are a small liberal arts school. Um, we're the only school in the country, as far as I know, that actually requires, regardless of major, that every student do a year of Greek and a year of Hebrew minimum in order to graduate. So um, we have programs in you know, computer science and biology and um, biblical and religious studies and history and, and so forth. Um, so that's what I do professionally. I'm al I also am the founder of um, a Christian apologetics ministry called talkaboutdoubts.com, uh, where we essentially offer private mentoring sessions to Christians that are struggling with doubts in relation to the uh, veracity of the Christian faith. So we deal with all kinds of topics, including uh, New Testament reliability, miracles, the resurrection, uh, divine hiddenness, problem of evil, um, evidence for the exodus from Egypt and, and so forth. Um, all of these topics are, are topics that we've covered and, and many others. And we have spe we have a, a assembled a team of specialists in different subjects with PhDs in fields ranging from biochemistry, biology, um, physics, astrophysics, New Testament scholarship, biblical archaeology, uh, biblical Hebrew, psychology. Um, we have therapists, we have uh, pastors on our team. Um, and basically the way that Talk About Doubts works is 
that someone goes on the website and there is a form there for people to fill out that uh, tells us um, what their name is, uh, their email address, how we can contact them. Um, and there's a, a place where they can write you know, a paragraph or two giving a summary of their primary concerns. Uh, and then we distribute that to one of our scholars, one of our specialists who has expertise relevant to that particular area. And then that scholar will get in touch with that individual and schedule a private uh, mentoring session via Zoom. Um, and so we've, uh, since we, we launched uh, the new site in December of last year, and since then we've had over 200 requests for private mentoring sessions. And uh, we also now actually have a Discord community for past inquirers to talk about doubts. Um, and, where, and we also have weekly hangouts with past inquirers on Tuesday evenings. Uh, and uh, we basically alternate between an emotional support group, which is actually run by one of our past inquirers who's since joined our team. And, um, and that runs every other week. And then every other week, we have an online course on evidences for Christianity, which I'm teaching as well. So that's a little bit about what I do. As you mentioned, I, I also have done a number of debates and I also give um, lectures and presentations. I have a lot of essays as well that you can find written in various venues in particular on my website, jonathanclatchy.com. That's a kind of the uh, place to go if you want to um, check out my writings and essays on various subjects. I'm I'm in, very interested in science, obviously, with my scientific background. I also am interested in New Testament scholarship um, and biblical scholarship more broadly as well. So I've written a lot of stuff on um, the, the case for the resurrection, New Testament reliability. And I'm also interested in epistemology and especially religious epistemology and how we can um, how we can uh, approach questions of faith and, and come to um, a, a rational conclusion as to which religious system best fits the evidence. Wow. Yeah, that's a mouthful. And and uh, as you could as you could tell, folks, uh, Dr. McClatchy is very well grounded, very well versed in, in these areas. And uh, he does have the website right on his cap. Uh, you know, uh, just like the high priest had the the he had the the mitre on his head. So Jonathan has talk uh, talk about dots dot com. Talk about doubts, not dots, but doubts dot com. Uh, and so uh, there's a lot of information in the description box. I've already provided you with uh, Dr. McClatchy's uh, website. Also, there's a there's a biography there about him, a short bio about what he does and his areas of specialization. But talkaboutdots.com, folks, get that website in your computer, on your favorites, uh, because you're going to meet people that are going to, uh, you're going to meet that may have been raised in the Christian church and they're doubting, they have a lot of struggles and so forth and so on. And so instead of sending them, you know, giving them a check, a check track, you could pass them on to uh, talk about DOS.com and uh, Dr. McClatchy will direct them to the right contact person. Um, so uh, again, this is a gift. This is a gift to the church uh, and and to others uh, if, if they have any doubts. So so, uh, Jonathan, we all know the famous doubter, Thomas. We know that one of Jesus' apostles, uh, you know, you know, the Lord Jesus Christ, when he chose his apostles, uh, they were kind of a, a mixed bag. Uh, you know, one was a zealot, another one was a tax collector. And, you know, put, put Simon and Matthew in a room, they would have killed each I mean, Simon would have killed Matthew, uh, being a, a zealot and, and having a hatred for tax collectors and so forth. And, of course, uh, the Lord Jesus also chose Thomas. And, and Thomas uh, has has gone down in Christian history, of course, as the doubter. Uh, and yet uh, he is the one who confesses Jesus as as Lord and God in the climax of, of, of the Gospel of John, John 20, 28. Uh, so doubting, I, let's just maybe talk a little bit about this, Jonathan, because, you know, Thomas was a doubter. And you, you do find biblical figures that struggle with this. I mean, even Job, with all his suffering, there are moments where he began to doubt uh, Jeremiah, you know, the weeping prophet and so forth. Maybe let's talk a little bit about this because I don't want people to think that Christians are, you know, we all wear capes and we're Superman, Supergirl and, and so forth. And, and we never struggle. We never have these doubts. Some of the great thinkers of the church, uh, you know, even Spurgeon had his, uh, you know, the, the night of the soul where, where he, he, he questioned his salvation, whether he really was saved or not. So maybe if we can talk a little bit about that, uh, Jonathan, maybe put some flesh on this uh, to let people know that, look, doubting is is not something that God, God is not offended by your doubts. Um, you know, he, he's he's got a big chin 
he can take it. Unlike another god we know very well, Jonathan, who has a glass chin, he can't take very well. And so his prophet and his his followers have to have to fight for his cause. But uh, anyway, maybe let's talk a little bit about this this idea of doubt and 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 what the Bible has to say about that. Absolutely, and of course, John the Baptist himself doubted uh, when he was sitting in prison. And uh, in Matthew 11, we read the story of John the Baptist sending some of his disciples to Jesus uh, to ask him, are you the one that we've been expecting or should we wait for another? And of course, Jesus doesn't say, no, shame on you, John, for, for having questions and doubts. Uh, rather, he says, well, go back to John, tell him what you hear and see. Uh, the blind receive their sight, their sight the, the deaf hear, uh, lepers are cleansed, um, the lame walk and so forth. Um, and in other words, tell them about the evidence that you've seen around you. And uh, so, you know, I, 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 the way that I see scripture, God, God and, and Jesus and the apostles and prophets, they're, they're evidentialists. They, they like to uh, commend an evidence-based faith. Uh, we see in the Old Testament that uh, in Deuteronomy 18, the test of a true prophet, how, how do we know that someone speaks from God or not? Well, Moses says, well, if he has a consistent track record of forecasting the future, only the God of Israel can do that. And so if he has a consistent track record of forecasting the future, then he, you can trust that he is actually speaking from the living God. Where, whereas uh, if he speaks false prophecies, even a single false prophecy, then he's spoken presumptuously and you need not be afraid of him. And of course, the penalty for speaking presumptuously on behalf of God is death if you mm -hmm. speak as a false prophet. Um, and so, um, the, the biblical text then uh, even prescribes that we are to judge the prophetic credentials of those who who purport or uh, present themselves as messengers of God. We are to judge them in accordance with the evidence. Uh, we see this uh, also in Isaiah 41, where God challenges the idolaters and says, you know, bring, bring forth your case, uh, set forth your arguments. Uh, can you predict the future the same way that the God of Israel can? Of course, the answer is mm -hmm. no. And so um, uh, we also see in, in uh, uh, the, the New Testament, how are the credentials of an apostle established? Well, in uh, 2 Corinthians, in chapter uh, 12, uh, Paul says, the signs of a true apostle were performed in your midst. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, there are certain authenticating signs that authenticate his apostolic office, uh, because God isn't expecting people to just take, it, take Paul at his word, rather, he actually gives him miraculous signs that he can use to vindicate that apostolic authority. Uh, mm -hmm. In the book of Acts, in chapter 17, when Paul is preaching in Athens, he says, God has set a day when he will judge the world by the man he has appointed. He has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. In fact, the, as you know, Tony, the, the word assurance there in the Greek is actually the accusative form of, of pistis, it's pistis, which mm -hmm. literally means faith, right? So God has given faith of this to all by raising him from the dead. We're often told by many that faith is this blind adherence to yeah. biblical positions. And that's, that's simply not the way that the, the Bible presents faith. Um, now we find uh, in uh, the book of Hebrews, there's a common argument that comes up trying to argue that faith is blind. Hebrews 11 verse one, where it says, faith is the substance of things hoped for the conviction of things unseen. Right. But when you look carefully at the context of Hebrews 11, what's going on there is that if you look um, it, the the way that, I think the author of Hebrews is defining faith there is that faith is trusting God for this future as un, as yet unrealized promises and view of his past faithfulness. Mm -hmm. So um, in the same way that uh, a man might trust his bride on their wedding day to fulfill her wedding vows, not because he's seen her do so because it's yet future, it hasn't happened already, but nonetheless, because of his past experience of her fidelity, her faithfulness, her integrity. And likewise, in view of, God's past faithfulness, these individuals who are spoken of in Hebrews 11 in that great faith hall of fame, uh, they trusted God with his future as yet unrealized promises in view of his past, uh, in view of God's past faithfulness. Another text that sometimes is brought up is uh, in John chapter 20, verse 29. This is, as you mentioned, uh, doubting yeah. Thomas. And uh, Thomas, of course, requests to see the prints of the nails that went through Jesus' hands and feet and the wind from the spear in Jesus' side. And uh, and then he confesses uh, that my Lord and my God, right? Right. And then Jesus in verse 29 says, because you have seen, you have believed. 
blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And so the skeptic says, there you go. There's Jesus commanding a, a fideistic type of faith where we, we don't need evidence or shouldn't have evidence to justify our beliefs. And that's not, I think, what Jesus is, is saying there. Rather, Jesus is chiding Thomas for having not believed in the face of sufficient evidence. Um, Thomas had been with Jesus throughout his entire ministry. He'd seen the miracles. He'd seen yeah. um, Jesus fulfill prophecies right in front of his eyes. Uh, he had the testimony of Jesus' resurrection from the other apostles, who, he, who, he, whom he had good reason to trust were, um, were not going to deceive him about such a matter and so forth. Um, and so Thomas, in spite of having had all that evidence, nonetheless, that evidence was not sufficient for him. And that's, I think, what Jesus is chiding him for. Mm -hmm. God doesn't tend to take so well when people demand more evidence than what ought to be rationally sufficient uh, to uh, justify um, belief. So um, that, I think, is, uh, in a nutshell, of what I think the biblical perspective is on the relationship between faith and evidence. I think, by the way, that we often um, speak improperly when we, speak, when we talk about faith, when we talk about belief requiring faith, this belief requires faith. Um, rather, faith is either justified or it's not justified. And the extent to which faith is justified should be directly proportional to the amount of evidence that we have supporting it. And in my judgment, the evidence for Christianity is uh, sufficient to justify very, very strong confidence in the veracity of uh, the Christian gospel. Yeah. No, I, I think Hebrews 11, 1, one of my favorite passages as well, you know, the evidence of things not seen, the substance of things hoped for. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, a lot of folks think that when they th when they think of faith, you see this usually in the faith and science debates, right, Jonathan? You, I'm sure you've seen a lot of that happening. Uh, a lot of folks, you know, they take the, the, the Kierkegaardian view of uh, faith as this leap into the dark. On the contrary, uh, faith is a leap into the light. And and faith is something, It is it is the evidence. It's not this uh, blind uh, hope that I hope it's true and I'm just going to jump into it. I don't know what's out there. I'm just going to jump in. That's not the biblical view of faith. Um, and also in 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Paul lists this 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 view, this list of, of various witnesses uh, to the resurrection and points out among them were the 500 that saw the risen Christ. Uh, although some of them fell asleep. Now, the purpose for mentioning the 500 uh, is as if to say that, look, um, some of them are still alive and, and they can vouch for what I said. And so it's not that Paul, a lot of folks think that Paul just took everything on faith. Well, if he did that, he wouldn't be citing the witnesses to the resurrection. He was bringing them in as, 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 as evidence for his case for the resurrection as well. So I, I think it's important that we 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 realize, and I think you've already enumerated on that, Jonathan, that that the Christian faith is not this empty-headed belief. Uh, it's not just faith in 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 something you hope is out there, but it is rooted in a, in a conviction. It's rooted on good grounds, um, and and of course, the resurrection I think is is the central uh, the central uh, ground here in the Christian faith that says because Christ has been raised from the dead, then he is who, who he claimed to be, and God, in a sense, has vindicated Christ in the resurrection. Absolutely, totally agree. Yeah, so so we already talked about some doubters in the Bible, John the Baptist, of course, uh, wondering if uh, Jesus was the one who was to come, the Messiah, and so forth. And, of course, the Lord doesn't chastise him for that or chide him for that. So God is not afraid of our questions. So why do you think it is, Jonathan, that a lot of Christians uh, doubt? What do you think is the source of uh, uh, these doubts that, and, and again, it doesn't mean that, I'm sure you've had your, your times where, you're, where you began to, well, you know, am I really saved? And, and, and is this really true? I mean, we all, we all go through those dark nights of the soul, as Spurgeon called it. Um, but what do you think, Jonathan, is the root cause of a lot of uh, doubts that uh, a lot of Christians in our contemporary society, what do you think is, is one of the root causes of these doubts? So it's very difficult to speak in generalities because as I often say, if you've talked to one deconvert, you've talked to one deconvert, right? Yeah. Uh, it's, it's very difficult to speak in generalities because there's such a diversity of what of reasons people might have for, for leaving the faith. And it, of course, a, indeed a diversity of experiences that accompany loss of faith. Some people, 
uh, feel much happier after their loss of faith. Some people feel completely depressed and miserable. Some people, um, for some people, it's um, uh, it, there's a sense that a company there, there's a sense of liberation that accompanies a loss of faith from what was perceived to be the shackles of this repressed repressive ideology. For others, it's um, a sense of uh, regret that they have lost their faith. Um, some for some people, you know, their their family shun them or act in other unhelpful ways. For some people, their family are very supportive. And it, and so it's, it's there's a diversity of experiences. There's also a diversity of reasons. Um, so um, I talk about doubts. We basically encounter everything across the map uh, of hmm. reasons that people have for questioning and doubting the Christian faith. Um, there are some, there are though some very common mistakes that people make some intellectual pitfalls that people can fall into that I think can bring about an, uh, a loss of faith, which is not necessarily rational. So for example, one uh, distinction I like to encourage people to make is the distinction between a question and an objection, right? Mm. Not every question is necessarily translates into an objection. A question can express an objection, sure, but for a question to become an objection, you need an additional premise. Either we do know the answer and that entails some sort of internal inconsistency or is it odds with empirical evidence, or we don't know the answer and if Christianity were true, we should expect to know the answer. Short of that additional premise, it remains simply a question. And we all have unanswered questions. There's no, there's no shame, there's nothing wrong with having unanswered questions. Every worldview has unanswered questions. Yeah. Um, it's, it's also not necessarily a problem to have unanswered objections to Christianity, objections that you don't have a fully satisfactory answer for. And there are certain objections that I don't, to this point, to this date, have a, satis a fully sat satisfactory answer to. The problem of evil, for example, would be among those. And I think there's a common misconception about the nature of evidence, that evidence is, um, is binary. So if you have any evidence going against Christianity, then that is sufficient reason to throw out the whole sh the whole show but i think that a more um, rational way of looking at the matter is to determine okay are there more object more substantive objections more numerous objections to believing the gospel to be true or to disbelieving it and in my assessment though there is evidence both for and against christianity as there is for all complex topics right right uh, the evidence on balance very strongly comes down on the side of christianity uh, in fact, I encourage people that if you ever encounter anyone representing an, a, a viewpoint regarding any complex matter, and they tell you that all of the evidence is on their side and they don't know of any evidence against it, then that person, probably confirmation bias is a very strong factor in, in that person's psychology. Because for all complex topics, unless, unless we're completely omniscient, which we're not, if we were right. completely omniscient and we had all the facts at our disposal, then all of the evidence would, with one happy accord, point in the direction of the truth. But since we don't have access to all the information, the evidence is more messy sometimes than we'd like it to be. Mm -hmm. So that's an important thing also. Um, also relating to this misconception about evidence being binary, um, on the flip side, it's often, there's a, a common misconception that if, if an, if, if, to say that X is evidence for Y entails that X has to prove Y or X has to fully justify why. And that's not necessarily the case. You can, uh, the, the case for Christianity is not predicated upon a single thread of evidence um, or a single spectacular piece of evidence. Rather, it's based on a whole meshwork of interconnecting mm -hmm. po and pieces of evidence that convergently point in the direction of Christianity. No one piece of evidence is sufficient to justify Christian belief, but all of the evidences taken in aggregate are sufficient to justify belief. Um, so to take an analogy, imagine um, that, um, imagine that, uh, imagine someone that has COVID, COVID-19. Now, what are some of the symptoms for COVID-19? Well, you've got a headache, you've got a sore throat, you've got a dry cough, fever, chills, uh, and muscle aches, and so forth. Now, if someone said, well, I, I must have COVID, I have a headache. Well, does that demonstrate that they have COVID-19? Well, no, 
because there's many other conditions that are consistent with having a headache right, right. or a sore throat. Well, there's many other conditions that are consistent with having a sore throat and so forth. But when you take all of the evidences together, then that is most consistent with the diagnosis that this person, in fact, has COVID-19. And this sort of reasoning, this sort of cumulative case reasoning is used all the time in, in legal settings where you're trying to prosecute a defendant and no one of the pieces of evidence is by itself sufficient right. to justify the conclusion that the defendant is indeed guilty. But you have to scotch tape together a lot of auxiliary hypotheses to make the data fit when really one hypothesis would do, which is the defendant committed the crime. And so we have to favor the simplest explanation that makes the most sense of the data and does so with the least the least strain and the least number of auxiliary hypotheses. Um, right. I also like to encourage people to distinguish between a high stakes objection and a low stakes objection, right? So not all objections are um, equally uh, high stakes. So for example, there are certain in-house debates that Christians can legitimately hold different perspectives on. There, for example, Calvinism versus Arminianism or young earth versus old earth creationism, mm -hmm. or um, eternal conscious torment versus conditional immortality in regards to the doctrine of hell and so forth. Now, um, you and I both take positions on all of those topics, but but we would both acknowledge, I think, that one there, there's there's a there, there's a plurality of viewpoints which are permissible for an orthodox Christian to to embrace, uh, and so. In my opinion, if one has a, 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 an objection to, say, the soteriology of Calvinism, in my judgment, it's more rational to adopt an Armenian view than it is to reject one's Christianity in toto, because you know there are you know, mainstream Orthodox, evangelical, conservative theologians who subscribe to both of those views, and there are defensible arguments for both of those views. Uh, mm -hmm. Likewise. Um, if one has a, a, an objection to young earth creationism, then the more rational course of action is to embrace old earth creationism and tweak one's hermeneutical uh, approach to the early chapters of Genesis rather than throwing out Christianity in total. Whereas on the other side, on the other hand, if you have an objection to say the resurrection or the historicity of Jesus or the deity of Christ or something like that, or the historicity of the Exodus from Egypt, that's much more serious yeah, uh, because um, these things are core to what Christianity is. If you don't have the resurrection, there is no Christianity. So I think that's a helpful distinction. And I, in the in the calls that I do, I talk about that. Is I try to encourage people to prioritize the higher stakes issues. Yes, we can certainly talk about the lower stakes issues as well. I'm happy to do that. But when we're when we all have a limited amount of time, I would I would encourage people to prioritize the high stakes objections and then. Uh, investigate the lower stakes objections once one has a satisfied mind in regards to the higher stake objections. Mm -hmm. uh, I also encourage people to investigate the evidences, not just against Christianity, but also for Christianity, because I think a lot of times people will investigate the evidence against Christianity. They'll read, you know, run into a Bart Ehrman, for example, yeah. um, or a Dale Allison and, uh, or, or a John Dominic Crossan, uh, and they will read those scholars and they will be completely blindsided by all these critical objections, uh, but they don't have any context <laughs> because yeah. they, they don't know what the positive case is. Right. Uh, and when you have when you have a robust understanding of the positive case for Christianity, that also helps you to contextualize pieces of evidence that actually do run against Christianity, such as the problem of evil, for example, because then you can actually determine, okay, where does the balance of evidence point? In fact, conspiracy theories in science are often started because people only focus on the anomalous data that doesn't quite make sense in the with, within the paradigm, but right. completely overlook that whole pillar of evidence that actually tends to confirm the theory in question. So right. um, these are just a few uh, helpful points. One other final point I'll make is that there's a very, there, there's a very common uh, psychological bias that uh, a lot of, a lot of people um, commit in my experience. And this is something I've only become aware of th through my calls that talk about doubts. Mm -hmm. It's kind of a converse, if you will, of the confirmation bias, right? We all know what the confirmation bias is, where you, yeah. where you uh, only look at the evidence that tends to confirm your view and ignore all the evidence to the contrary. And all of us have confirmation bias to some extent, and we try to, of course, mitigate mm -hmm. against that confirmation bias. But there's mm -hmm. also a danger of going the other direction 
and becoming so concerned about your confirmation bias that you don't trust the, your judgment when it comes to your inspection of the positive evidences for Christianity. And that's right, that right. over over concern about confirmation bias is also a danger that I've seen in many people that I've, I've talked to. Yeah. And maybe you can say a little bit, Jonathan, about we hear we hear a lot of evidence, word, words like evidence. But what would you say is a is the difference between proof and evidence? And so people will say, prove it to me. Where's your proof? Uh, and 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 what is your evidence? So maybe can you say a little bit about those two words? Because I think a lot of folks uh, uh, use them almost interchangeably. So if you could just comment on that. Sure. So proof has a technical definition in, in science and mathematics, which is that it entails the truth of the conclusion beyond all doubt. So two plus two equals four is a is a proof, right? Uh, this is a mathematical proof. You can also get proof in, in deductive logic. So if A, then B, A, therefore B. Um, right. And uh, and so that that is a proof in, in deductive logic, which is a, a you know, logical syllogism sure. where you have sure. a rule of inference that can justify with certainty the conclusion, given that the premises are true. And of course, right. the conclusion of a logical syllogism is only as good as the, as the certainty of the, of the premises. Uh, an evidence, on the other hand, is that which raises the probability of a pro proposition being true relative to what it would have been otherwise. Right. Right. So an analogy to help conceptualize what I mean by evidence and what I think is the best way of, of thinking about evidence is imagine that you have a court scene and the expert witness steps forward, the forensic scientist or the detective, to put forward to, to present the the murder weapon as a piece of evidence and on the handle of the murder weapon are the fingerprints of the accused now does that prove that the defendant is guilty well no i mean you could think of some other potential explanations of how the fingerprints came to be there but it is evidence because the probability of the accused fingerprints being in the murder weapon are higher if he actually committed the crime than it would have been otherwise right uh, now it's it's not always necessary for us to give an exact um, uh, strength of, of how much you would expect the evidence given one hypothesis versus how much you would expect given the other hypothesis. We we engage in this sort of reasoning all the time. So an analogy that my colleague Dr. Timothy McGrew likes to give is mm -hmm. imagine that you're in the forest and you come across a cabin, yeah, and you don't know whether it's inhabited, and so uh, you open the door and there, lo and behold, there is a cup of Earl Grey tea that's still steeping. It's not at room temperature. Of course, and you have to say Earl Grey because you're you're British. So, exactly. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm I I live in Boston, of course, where the you know, Boston Tea Party. Is. Of course, yeah. Um, exactly. But yeah, exactly. and so the so the um, the tea is still steeping, and does so that constitutes evidence that the cabin is inhabited. Why? Because it's far more likely that you would observe the steeping cup of Earl Grey tea, then it would be on the falsity of the hypothesis that the cabin is inhabited. Now, it doesn't necessarily need to be highly probable that you that if the cabin is inhabited, you would find the cup of Earl Grey tea. In fact, it's quite improbable. Uh, but it's far. But the, the point is that it's far more probable, given that it is inhabited, than it than if it were not inhabited. And so, therefore it tends to confirm, you've got this top heavy likelihood ratio. So it tends yeah. to confirm that the, that the cabin is indeed inhabited. And so that's how I understand evidence. Mm -hmm. The preponderance of, of the right. weight, I guess. Yeah. Gotcha. Exactly. So, so, um, I mean, in the past year or so there, there have been some, um, prominent, uh, I mean, let's use the word prominent evangelicals that basically threw in the towel and said, well, I'm done with this. Uh, this really is not doing it, anything for me. Um, what do you think, Jonathan, is the main reasons that people give as to why they just, uh, I mean, is it, is it, um, in some cases, I guess it's sexual orientation. They feel that they're gay and therefore th there's no place for them in the Orthodox Christian tradition. Um, or do you think it's, uh, do you think it's, uh, an emotional, uh, Christianity is not really doing anything for me. Um, what, what do you think, uh, in your opinion, and, and I'm sure you've run across some of these, these folks, what do you think, um, 
is the main factor. At, I, I, maybe I'm, I'm repeating myself here, but what do you think is the main factor here that has basically led them to throw a towel and say, I give up? Yeah, so I'm hesitant to say that um, this is the reason why people deconvert because right, there's uh, a diversity. Yeah, yeah, there, there's a diversity. And I think that unfortunately, I've seen uh, some Christians say things like uh, people only leave Christianity because you know they want to sin or uh, that, you know, that, that they, they didn't want to be accountable to a creator or, or what have you, or they were hurt by the church. That's true for some individuals. It's not true for others. We, we can't just generalize like that. Right. As I said, right. if you've talked to one uh, ex-Christian, you've talked to one ex-Christian. Uh, there's a plurality of reasons people leave. Uh, certainly, um, I mean, people can feel feel hurt by the church. Uh, I, 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 um, Tim McGrew, for example, t uh, tells a story in his presentations sometimes about someone that he's familiar with who had doubts about you know, Christianity and they went to their pastor and they asked, you know, they, they said, you know, pastor, I'm having doubts about the faith concerning X, Y, and Z issues. And the pastor merely put his Bible down on the, on the table, passed it along, slid, slid, slid it along the table to him and said, this is the gospel. Do you believe it? And the guy said, no. And he got up and left and said um, that uh, that was, you know, the, the, he, he knew at that moment that was the last time he'd ever said from the church again. So right. um, unfortunately, pastors have often mishandled this this area, unfortunately. And mm -hmm. I, I really see the work that we're doing at Talk About Devs is, is essentially fulfilling the role that pastors ought to be doing. There, we, there shouldn't be a need for Talk About Devs. Uh, there should be um, a role of apologetics pastor in the same way that you know, you've got youth pastors and children's pastors and so forth. There ought to be an apologetics pastor role. Unfortunately, uh, the churches, I think, have failed in the responsibilities in this area. And this is why we're seeing this avalanche, the tsunami of apostasy in our generation. Yeah. And so I, I really, especially when you know, we, we have uh, kids you know, going, to, going to school um, or university and they're there you know, five days of the week, and then they come to church for you know an hour on Sunday. That's that's just not sufficient. And they, they don't have they're not equipped with the right. materials that they need to uh, to assess and evaluate those arguments. And mm -hmm. I, I think that is I think that we've done ourselves a great disservice. And so yeah. I think that's that's why we need a ministry like talk about those. Yeah, I totally agree with you, Jonathan. That uh, and and. For 30 years of my life, my ministry, I'm not 30 years old, but I, 30 years of my ministry, um, this has been my observation that the reason why we are seeing this avalanche, uh, as you put it, this tsunami, uh, is because the church has not done its job in educating uh, her people. Um, pastors are not apologetically trained or oriented. And uh, most often than not, uh, most of the church is, is mostly just... It's preaching, but it doesn't really um, equip or it doesn't really edify or, or train its people on how to defend their faith. So so when kids go off to university or to college, as you know, uh, more often than not, they come out the other side either uh, as agnostics, not knowing whether God exists or not, not knowing really what to believe, or in some cases, worst case scenarios, they become atheists. Um, and, and I think you're right. It is a great disservice where we do have resources. There are resources out there that can be implemented into Sunday schools and to, you know, midweek uh, prayer groups and, and, and uh, Bible lessons and so forth. And when, when pastors um, give up that role of feeding the sheep and, and, and tending the sheep in that respect, um, I usually use the comparison, Jonathan, of when we send our when we send our soldiers out into the into the battlefield, we train them first. They go through rigorous training and so forth, so that they when they meet the enemy in in the in the battlefield, they're they're prepared. And what we're doing is we're we're not spiritually arming our people. We're not we're not putting them through boot camp. We're not training them. And so when we send them out to these universities and colleges, and they're on the spiritual battlefield, they they don't know how. To, how to defend themselves. So, and, and I'm sure with you, in, in my case, when I was in my undergraduate studies and graduate studies at the universities, um, I was prepared. Um, 
and and some of these profs were not they're pretty nasty when when you challenge them in the classroom and you put them on the spot uh one of them threatened to to fail me and kick me out of the class because i asked too many questions um but i think that we have done ourselves a great disservice um and and another area you special specialize in as well jonathan is, is islam and as you know a lot of christians end up converting to islam because they're they're theologically very weak um a lot of young women end up falling in love with muslim men and then they they decide to marry them convert to islam they marry them or if they haven't converted they will convert in due time um and so a lot of this i think does fall on the shoulders of of the pastors um all the apostles were apologists we know that the apostles weren't just shepherds but we also know that they defended the gospel you know peter says always be ready to give an answer to those who ask of you a uh, jude says Con content for the faith once for all delivered to the saints and so uh, it just seems that it has fallen on uh people like ourselves uh you know as the gatekeepers to to train th these folks but but it's been my passion to see churches uh teaching apologetics and i th i really believe apologetics is the missing link in the christian witness uh, and I, I really do think that um as you rightfully said jonathan you're seeing the you're seeing the the uh the uh the aftermath of what happens when um we don't train our people uh, especially our young people right absolutely i completely agree and i think another related problem is that in many churches that people grew up in they are basically given a my way or the highway theology yeah. or a, you know a house of cars theology where christianity is a particular pastor's interpretation of of the bible and so mm -hmm. when people go out to university and college and discover there's actually quite a bit of evidence that undermines the idea of the earth is you know, six thousand years old or, or what have you then rather than just tweaking their interpretation of the early chapters of genesis they throw out christianity in toto and i think yeah. that we have to uh I think that pastors should tell their congregants that those in their in their congregations the full spectrum of views that exist within you know orthodox conservative Christianity and allow people to you know assess and appraise the evidence for themselves and also I, I like the way Bobby Conway puts this Pastor Bobby Conway mm -hmm. he says uh, he he wrote the book uh, Doubting Towards Faith and he says that. Um, he wants to be as conser as liberal as possible about his conservatism without lapsing into heresy. <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. think that we need to hold the the non essentials of the faith with a loose grip, and and hold tightly to the the essentials of the faith. Uh, and so I think that if we were to do that more, then that would help to um, help to mitigate against uh, this uh, the tsunami of, of apostasy that we're observing in our day. So I, I think that's, um, that, that would certainly help um, with the situation. Right. So these questions that come in, uh, Jonathan, um, what would you say the majority of them are? are? Are they doubts about God's existence? Are they, are they questions about evolution and creation? <clears throat> are they doubts about the Bible's uh, credibility and authenticity? What would you say uh, the, the main the main doubts are in which area do you think they 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 lie on uh all of the above <laughs> okay. all of the above and a lot more uh there's a, a a great diversity probably i mean some of the most popular ones that come in i guess would be new testament reliability the plausibility of miracles divine hiddenness the problem of evil mm -hmm. uh, i'd say these are probably the top ones that come in um yeah the New, Test New Testament reliability in the case for miracles, the plausibility of miracles, that's kind of my favorite area to, to deal with because I love to point people to the incredible evidence that we have for, for the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, the argument from uh, hiddenness, I think, is a lot weaker than many people suppose. I have an essay on my website uh, interacting with the problem of, of divine hiddenness. Uh, the problem of evil, I think, is a more difficult challenge, but I think that there is sufficient... Um, evidence that Christianity is true to provide an indirect justification for thinking that God has some morally sufficient reason for permitting the evil and suffering that he does in the world, even if that explanation presently eludes us. A, a common point, by the way, that often gets overlooked on the problem of evil is the, the instances of evil and suffering in the world are not epistemically independent. And what, I'm, uh, what I mean by that is 
that if God has a morally sufficient justification for permitting one instance of suffering in the world, then he may well have a similar morally sufficient justification for permitting a second instance and a third instance and so forth. And so there's a depreciating returns by multiplying examples. With each successive example, the evidential value uh, decreases. And so but by contrast, though, with the case for theism and Christianity more particularly, the evidence is not only extensive, but also varies in kind. So you have you know, multiple, um, a, a multidisciplinary case for three, theism and Christianity more specifically. And, uh, and then another point that often gets overlooked on the problem of evil is that uh, evil and suffering by their very nature require conscious objective experience. And uh, you cannot, and, and conscious objective experience as people like Richard Swinburne have shown is far more probable given the supposition of theism than it is on naturalism. And so the evil and suffering actually is quite unlikely whether you're a theist or a naturalist or an atheist. And, right. and theism and atheism are of course two mutually, exclu mutually exhaustive uh, propositions. And yeah. so uh, it, so that that also is is a relevant uh, consideration, right? So what happens in cases, uh, Jonathan, where uh, people uh, write in and say, "Well, what do we do with miracles in other religious traditions?" Uh, for example, mm -hmm. Roman Catholics will will usually cite the Marian apparitions, uh, uh, Fatima, for example, or um, uh, various um, various appearances of Mary, and and so on. Um, or, uh, or alleged miracles that have been performed in by saints of other religious traditions, whether they be Hindus or or Sikhs. Um, uh, what would your response do? Uh, what, what would your response be to those who will say, "Well, well we also got miracles in in, in Islam. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, we got miracles in, in in Buddhism or or Hinduism, and 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 uh, we have these Marian apparitions that, that are." Proving the the papacy and proving the Roman Catholic Church and so forth, and so so what what is usually your response to those who try to uh, you know bring their miracles along as well and say well why why can't we believe this over your your Christian claims? Sure. So you have to look at the particulars of the case and you have to look at the the details. We have to actually take a deep dive into the particulars uh, and. When we look at the case for the resurrection, we find that uh, I, I think that the case for the Gospels and Acts being rooted in credible eyewitness testimony is extremely compelling. I, I think that there's sufficient reason to think that the Gospels and Acts are written by individuals who are well informed, they're close up to the facts, they're habitually scrupulous. That being the case, then you have a justification for thinking that the claims in the Gospels and Acts concerning the nature and variety of the resurrection encounters with the risen Jesus are reflective of the testimony of those who were purportedly eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. Uh, and when you inspect those testimonial claims, you find that they are multi-sensory in character, involving multiple sensory modes. They're not just individual sightings at a distance and very briefly or something like that, but rather they're group sightings through conversations with Jesus, long discourses with Jesus, physical contact with Jesus. They're according to Acts 1, exam for support to the time period. Uh, you've got Jesus, you've got eating breakfast with Jesus in the Shrove Sea of Galilee. You've got Jesus eating raw fish in their presence in Luke 24 and so forth. Um, uh, so it's, it's a sort of set of testimonial claims. It's very difficult to be honestly mistaken about. And so that redistributes the, pro the probabilities between the two remaining contending hypotheses. Because when anyone makes any sort of testimonial claim, whether that be a you know, witness to a miracle or a sexual assault allegation, whatever it happens to be, there are three and only three broad explanatory categories, namely that they're, they're correct or they're honestly mistaken or they're setting out to deceive people um, or some combination thereof. Right. But when uh, so by reducing significantly the plausibility of the hypothesis that the disciples were honest and mistaken, you redistribute the probabilities between those two remaining options, namely they lied about it or Jesus, in fact, was raised from the dead. And uh, another factor, by the way, that also um, argues against the hypothesis of being honest and mistaken is the fact that Jesus is raised, according to all four Gospels, on the, the Lord's Day, the first day of the week, which it coincides with the Feast of First Fruits. And of course, yeah. Paul in verse 15 describes Paul as being the uh, first fruits from among the dead. In other words, the first to be raised to glory and immortality, who's the guarantor of the general resurrection that is to be delivered, just as the first fruits of the harvest was the guarantor of the remainder of the harvest. And according to Leviticus 23, the first fruits was to be celebrated, that that feast was to be celebrated on the day, follow the day following the first Sabbath 
following Passover, which would make it the Sunday. And so it's, it's striking then that all four Gospels make, make Jesus' resurrection or report Jesus' resurrection as being the Sunday. And this is very, very widely attested because the early Christians actually changed their sacred day from the Sabbath day, which is the Jewish sacred day, to the first day of the week uh, or the Lord's day and even call it the, the Lord's day. And the early church writers say that the reason they forsook Sabbath observance and started commemorating the Lord's day was because that's the day in which Jesus rose from the dead. So, right. and that belief goes very, very early back. There's no competing tradition that we know of in, in the early church as far as what day of the, the week was considered sacred. Mm -hmm. So that, that's interesting. Now that, because of the coincidence with the Feast of First Fruits and the theological import of that, that tends to point away from the hypothesis of being honest and mistake. And that points to design, either in the part of the human authors or on the part of, of God raising Jesus from the dead on that special day. And um, so what about the hypothesis then that they were setting out to deceive people? Well, when we look at the reports that we find in Acts and the letters of Paul and, and, and elsewhere, um, Clement of Rome, for instance, or, or Tacitus, we find that the, the conditions in which the early Christians proclaimed the, uh, the gospel, um, including the resurrection, was not conducive to their self-interest. Uh, mm -hmm. They voluntarily underwent sufferings and labors and dangers and hardships and persecutions and toils, in some cases martyrdom, against their self-interest um, on account of their testimony of Christ raised from the dead. And so that is surprising if they're simply making stuff up. Right. Um, but it's not hugely surprising on the hypothesis that they're actually telling the truth. Multi-party conspiracies, when, especially when you have lots of people involved, invariably break down, especially when life or liberty are at stake. And um, of course, you, another factor to consider when it comes to the hypothesis of deliberately lying is the use of women as a chief discoverers of the empty tomb, yeah. uh, according to all four Gospels. And actually, these are independent of each other on this point. Right. And uh, the uh, use of women, of course, in patriarchal society is surprising because the testimony of a woman was not was worth half of that, of, of, you know, a fraction of that of a male witness. And so if they're just simply making stuff up, why involve the women? In fact, why involve the women at all? I mean, that's just involving extra people that could potentially disconfirm the story, especially you know, there, there are other influences that are outside the apostles' control, like uh, the, the husbands of those women, for example. Yeah. Um, so um, I, I don't find the hypothesis of conspiracy to be particularly compelling. And so um, having significantly reduced the plausibility of those two competing explanations, it renders the most likely explanation of the pertinent facts, the hypothesis that, in fact, God raised Jesus from the dead. Um, now, one related object one objection that sometimes is raised is well god um, i mean miracles seem to deviate from the way nor nature normally behaves right we don't observe people being raised from the dead and so why should we favor the resurrection hypothesis because a, the miracle by definition is the least plausible explanation that's why it's a miracle if it wasn't yeah. very implausible then it wouldn't be a miracle and so right. as a historian we can't infer a miracle as the best or most adequate explanation of the pertinent data because the miracle by its very nature has to be the least plausible. So no matter how implausible the mass hallucination hypothesis might be, it's still going to be more plausible than the idea that a miracle has occurred. And um, this um, argument, of course, was developed and pioneered by David Hume, famous Scottish philosopher. Uh, it, um, it was, of course, uh, Carl Sagan uh, famously said that uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Yeah. And, and Bart Ehrman, of course, when he does debates on the resurrection, he will champion this sort of argument. Now, I yeah. think this argument is actually fundamentally flawed, and here's why. If we take the hypothesis that God has wrought miracles in history as authenticating science, which is the claim of both the Old and New Testaments, that's the purpose for which miracles are wrought, yeah. Yeah. then they have to stand out noticeably, recognizably. They have to recognizably deviate from the way nature normally behaves. If they didn't, they would be robbed of their evidential value. And so the hypothesis in question then predicts with a high level of probability that miracles are going to recognizably deviate from the way nature normally behaves. And so it can't be used as an argument against the hypothesis when that hypothesis predicts that very observation. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, an important uh, consideration. I also would add that um, even supposing that uh, the, that, um, 
you've got a very small intrinsic probability on the hypothesis of God raising any old miscellaneous Joe Blow from the dead. It um, God doesn't seem to be in the business of raising people from the dead. So it's, it's a very small intrinsic probability that any random person would be raised from the dead by God. It doesn't necessarily follow that it's equally intrinsically improbable in the case of Jesus specifically, because there could be, and I think there are in fact, independent reasons to think that God plausibly has motivation for raising Jesus of Nazareth specifically from the dead. Uh, other independent lines of evidence that bear on Jesus' messianic and divine identity, such as uh, the trilemma argument that C.S. Lewis developed, which I think has, right. has been uh, the argument from messianic prophecy, uh, the conversion of the apostle Paul, um, the, um, uh, and, and so it can, the argument from contemporary miracles, the argument from the survival of the nation of Israel against all odds and so forth, all of those arguments taken in aggregate also bear positively on the uh, reality of the God of Israel and the messianic and divine identity of Jesus of Nazareth. And so that provides independent reason to think that God might well have motivation for raising Jesus specifically from the dead and therefore is positively relevant to the intrinsic likelihood that God would perform a miracle in Jesus' case. Right, right. Yeah, so that, those are really, really very important points you raised there, uh, Jonathan. So uh, what I wanted to do, folks, is let you know that uh, if you have any questions uh, for Dr. McClatchy, if, if you can just put a Q uh, in the chat there and put your question in, we're uh, we're going to get to your questions. And I, I've noticed there's a couple already in there. Uh, so you don't mind taking some questions, uh, Jonathan? Absolutely, please. I can tell you love questions because uh, I've been throwing them at you. So, uh, <laughs> okay, so let's get, uh, let's get a couple of these questions up here. Um, let me see. We had a question here. Uh, let me just grab that here. Um, okay. We have a question here from truth defenders. Does McClatchy believe the Bible can stand alone in credibility on his historical narratives, or does he believe the Bible because he trusts secular historians more to verify the Bible? So my confidence in the credibility and veracity of the biblical text is based exclusively on the publicly available evidence, uh, not what any secular story in Christian or secular has to say about that evidence. My, assess, my, my confidence in Christianity and the veracity of the biblical text is based on my assessment of, of the evidence, which I think um, puts the, the veracity of Christianity uh, essentially beyond a reasonable doubt. Uh, so. Um, so uh, does that answer the question? I think it does. Mm -hmm. I think it does. Yeah. Now we do have a, a question here. Um, let me see. Uh, well, first of all, I just want to just thank uh, thank you, Ringo Cat. Watch your late last video, Evidence for the Crucifixion. Just want to say thank you for the upload. Great info. Well, thank you, uh, Ringo Cat. I uh, appreciate that. Um, so we had a question here, a couple of questions from uh, Paul uh moy the other doubt i have is the story of um G sorry let me just get there was another one mm -hmm. i think up here by uh, paul uh let me see if i could find that uh, he says here uh, sorry if this was answered already i'm having doubts with a couple of stories in the gospels one is the story of jesus being in the desert for 40 days and nights and the temptation from satan um so I'm not sure exactly what the problem is with that narrative, Paul. Um, not exactly sure. Um, you want to take a jab at it, uh, Jonathan? Yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. Uh, maybe you could clarify in the chat what his particular concern is. It might be that it's not attested elsewhere, perhaps, uh, outside of the Gospels. Uh, but that would be, of course, an argument from silence, which is not a very compelling way of arguing because there's so many counter examples where we have events that you might expect to be in a particular source that aren't. For example, um, in the first century, you have um, um, during the time of Claudius, Claudius orders all of the Jews to leave Rome. Uh, and that is recounted in the book of Acts mm -hmm. uh, uh, in chapter 18, because uh, that's why um, Paul comes to be acquainted with uh, Priscilla and Aquila. Right. But there's uh, that. Acts is actually the only first century source that talks about it. Uh, now, it is mentioned in a Roman source in the second century, namely Suetonius, in his life of Claudius. But it's surprising that no other source thought to mention it. Uh, so, I mean, there's plenty of examples like this. Uh, if you are interested in more, there is a good paper by Dr. Timothy McGrew on the argument from silence, uh, which uh, talks a lot about these sorts of examples, which, are, which I think helps to calibrate our expectations of what we should or shouldn't find. Yeah. Well, the temptation narratives, I mean, if the question has to do with uh, there was no one else there other than Jesus, 
Um, well, we need to understand. I, I, I think if we look at the book of Acts chapter 1, we're told that that for 40 days, Jesus uh, appeared to them with uh, many infallible proofs that he was alive. And during that time period, uh, Jesus was a teacher. He, he would have recounted things to them. Uh, he would have brought things to their remembrance and so forth and so on. And so it's not beyond uh, credibility to, to believe that Jesus would have recounted many of these experiences. Uh, and so the temptation narrative does appear in Matthew, does appear in Luke. Some scholars talk about it as being part of the Q material because there's, there's agreement between Matthew and Luke on that. But Mark also makes reference to it. You don't have the dialogue between Jesus and Satan in Mark 1, but Mark says that he was out in the wilderness with the wild animals uh, and he was tempted uh, for 40 days. Uh, and so Mark is an independent witness to that as well. He just mentions it. He doesn't go into the dialogue aspect. But it's not beyond uh, credulity for Jesus to uh, to have communicated that uh, to uh, his disciples. Uh, the same, Paul also has a question here, Jonathan. The, the other doubt I have is the story of Jesus praying alone on the mountain and what he said. I'm assuming he means Gethsemane. When all the disciples were asleep, mm -hmm. how, how did we know he said those things? So I think this is just one of these issues where we just don't know um, the answer to that question. Um, I mean, perhaps, as Tony just said, perhaps uh, Jesus talked about it after you know, his resurrection or something like that. And in the case of, by the way, the, the temptation narrative, it doesn't necessarily even need to be the case Jesus talked about it after his resurrection. I mean, if there is a lot of time between the temptation in the wilderness and Jesus' death for Jesus to, to tell them about the sojourn in the wilderness. Um, so I don't find those arguments uh, to be particularly compelling. Also, um, notice, so th there, there are some cases where there are private dialogues where we actually do have some reason in scripture to postulate um, a, um, why an author might come to know about a particular private dialogue. So for instance, in Matthew 14, you have Herod talking to his servants. It says that Herod, the Tetrarch, heard about the fame of Jesus and he said to his servants, um, this is John the Baptist who's been raised from the dead. That's why these miraculous powers are working him. Now, Matthew actually uniquely adds, the, though this story is also paralleled in Mark, Matthew uniquely adds the words to his servants. Now, presumably this dialogue is happening in the privacy of uh, Her Herod's own palace. So how does the author of Matthew know what Herod is saying to his servants in the privacy of his own palace? Well, he turned to Luke 8, in the first three verses and we read that there were certain women who followed jesus from galilee one of whom is told to us to be joanna the wife of chusa herod's household manager and so one of jesus female disciples is actually uh, married to someone in the highest ranks of herod's employment which then illuminates how matthew presumably could come to know what herod was saying to his servants in the, in the privacy of his own palace Yes, yes. And of course, Dr. Uh, Lydia McGrew has written on that. I think her book, mm -hmm. Hidden in Plain View, I believe, yeah. Undesigned mm -hmm. Coincidences. Right. And so uh, if you guys have not uh, read Dr. McGrew's book, uh, Lydia McGrew, she's also written a great book on the uh, authenticity of the Gospel of John called uh, The Eye of the Beholder. Um, so both her, uh, Dr. Lydia McGrew and her husband, Dr. Timothy McGrew, have done a lot of work in this area and, uh, and have been a great inspiration to both to both myself and, and Dr. McClatchy. And another one would also be Jonathan, the the the, uh, the servant of the high priest who, who uh, when Peter cuts off the yeah. ear of the servant of the high priest, I mean, John mentions him by name. And how would John know? Well, because we we're told that John was was known by the high priest. Right. And so John would have had access to this information about uh, his, uh, obviously his army or his uh, foot soldiers, his servants and, and so forth and so on. So it's a, it's a delightful area of study uh, and, and I know you've also written, Jonathan, not just in the New Testament, but I know you've also done some undesigned coincidences in the Old Testament as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, again, I, I know Paul does sound like he's struggling here, uh, Jonathan. And so, right. Paul, mm -hmm. you've come to the right spot, the right place. Uh, Talkaboutdots.com is a great website to check out. So just beginning to think the Gospels are making him. Uh, I guess, Jesus, more of a mythical person. Um, so, Jonathan, I'll just say something, then I'll hand it over to you. Uh, C.S. Lewis, you know, the famous uh, the famous uh, uh, writer, uh, uh, remember what he said, that he's read fables and he's read myths and he's read a lot of these, uh, these uh, uh, this type of genre, genre of writing. 
And uh, one of his famous statements was that the Gospels don't read that way. The Gospels don't read like uh, fables and, and myth and so forth and so on. Um, so um, do you want to take that on, Jonathan, that question? Absolutely. I'd be glad to. Um, so we talked a little bit about um, undesigned coincidences. For those of you who aren't familiar with that term, an undesigned coincidence is when you have multiple accounts to concern an event uh, and they intersect or interlock in a way that's surprising if one is just borrowing from the other or both copying from a common source or if the story is being fictionalized. And uh, I, this often confirms very minor or very specific details that we find in the gospel accounts. So, for instance, um, in John 6, uh, in verse 5, we read uh, concerning the uh, piece of uh, the, the feeding of the 5,000. It says, lifting up his eyes and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, where do you buy bread so these people may eat? And this you know, very specific detail in John, you know, how does, um, why, why does Jesus turn to Philip in particular? Um, why not say Judas Iscariot is in charge of the money bag or something like that? Well, you turn you know, six chapters later to John chapter 12, and here we have um, in, in a different pastor or feast, completely unrelated context. Um, it says, verse 20, among those who went up to worship at the feast were some Greeks. So these came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee. So we learn in this very parenthetical and casual remark in John 12 that Philip's actually from a town called Bethsaida in Galilee. Now, we turn over to Luke's account in Luke chapter 9. This is the parallel of the feeding of the 5,000 miracle. And we learn that the event actually takes place in Bethsaida. Uh, that's in verse 10. It says, on the return, the apostles told him all they had done, and he took them and drew apart to a temple beside him. That's where the feeding of the 5,000 takes place. Now, J Luke does not mention Philip in this context at all. Right. Um, and John doesn't mention Bethsaida as the setting of the miracle story. But you put the pieces together, and now we have a complete picture of why Jesus turns to Philip in John 6, 5. He's a local guy. He knows where the shops are to buy bread. Um, that sort of feature, that, that sort of coincidence is so artless and casual that it, I think that it's best explained on the hypothesis that we're dealing here with historical reportage. There's also actually, an, um, so the, the feeding of the 5,000 is actually the only miracle besides the resurrection that's found in all four gospels. And uh, there's another uh, account of the feeding of the 5,000 in Mark 6. And we read in Mark 6, in verse uh, 31, um, verse 30 and 31, it says, the apostles returned to Jesus and told them all they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest a while, for many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And so this gives you a picture of the hustle and bustle of the place. It's so busy, they can't find leisure to eat their lunch. So they have to go to a deserted area to eat to get some mm -hmm. peace and quiet. But unfortunately for them, the crowds actually follow. And then you get to verse 39, and we read that um, Jesus commanded the crowds to sit down in groups on the green grass. Now, yeah. the grass in uh, Israel is actually not green it's brown throughout the majority of the year except at a relatively narrow window of time during the spring that coincides with the feast of passover because of you know the high levels of rainfall so when you go over to john's account john doesn't mention the people coming and going he also doesn't mention the green grass but he does mention in verse four now the passover the feast of the jews was at hand and so mm -hmm. then that illuminates why it's so busy because there's all these jewish pilgrims coming in for yeah. the feast of passover and also why the grass is green but does so in such a casual and artless way that it tends to confirm the historicity, the veracity of the biblical text. And so that's just uh, an evidence sampler of just a couple of examples. There's a lot more. If you want more, you can go to Livy McGrew's book, uh, Hidden in Plain View, Undesigned Coincidences in the Gospels and Acts. That also covers plenty of examples between the book of Acts and the letters of Paul. Uh, real quickly, though, there's also, in addition to these uh, undesigned coincidences, there's also extra biblical incidental support for the gospel accounts. Uh, an example of that would be, um, so in, in Mark chapter 6, you have uh, John the Baptist, who is um, who's, uh, beheaded, and but the, re the reason why Herod Antipas has John the Baptist put in prison is given to us in Mark, as that Herod um, was um, upset because John the Baptist had been complaining about Herod's adulterous relationship yep. with uh, with uh, Herodi with his brother's wife Herodias, and um, and the, um, of course um, Herod Antipas doesn't like this, so he has John imprisoned. Now we read, according to Josephus, first-century Jewish historian, that uh, so Herod had um, divorced his other his previous wife also in order to marry Herodias. And 
this previous wife of Herod's had gone back to her father, namely Aretas the fourth king of the Nabataeans, and this had resulted in a war between Herod the Great, sorry, Herod the Antipas, and his former father-in-law, um, Aretas the fourth king of the Nabataeans. Mm -hmm. And so Herod Antipas actually lost that war. And Josephus tells us that there was a circulating rumor that among the Jews that the destruction of Herod's armies came as a judgment from God because of the way that Herod Antipas had treated John the Baptist. Mm -hmm. And when we read the biblical account, we discover um, a detail which makes perfect sense of why that would be a circulating rumor, because it was John the Baptist's complaints against Herod Antipas' adulterous relationship that got him thrown in prison by Herod in the first yep. place and got him beheaded. And, would, um, and, um, and so the, it, all, it all makes sense. And also, you, you might ask, well, Josephus actually gives us a different explanation for the motive, a different motive for, for Herod. Josephus tells us that the reason Herod had put, had John the Baptist in prison was because of his suspicious temper and his fear of an uprising. Now, the reasons between the reasons that Mark and Josephus give us are not necessarily ex mutually exclusive. They could both mm -hmm. be part of the reason. But That's how right. come Mark knows this insider information about Herod's motive, even though it's different from the motive that Josephus gives us? Well, again, we know from Luke 8 that Jesus had a female disciple who was married to someone in the highest ranks of Herod's employment. So that's just you know a, a taster of some of the, yeah. the 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 evidence that we have for the high gospel reliability. Right, right. Well, uh, thanks for that, Paul. Uh, thanks, Tony. That helped. You're very welcome, Paul. That's why we're here. That's why Jonathan is here, and uh, that's why uh, uh, he has uh, talked about doubt, doubt, doubts com to deal with these types of questions. So. Keep asking, keep asking questions. Uh, you know, God is not afraid of your questions. He He invites us. You know, Isaiah one eighteen, come, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as uh, wool, and though they're red as crimson, they shall be white as snow. So don't be, you know, don't. It's not irreverent to ask questions of God. Uh, God will not hate you for asking questions. Muhammad will, you know, Allah hated you. Muhammad said for asking too many questions. But the God of the Bible is not afraid of your questions. He welcomes them. Right. In fact, um, okay. uh, there's a proverb that says, Pro Proverbs 14, verse 15, the simple man believes everything, but the prudent gives thought to his steps. That's it. Exactly. All right. So let's see. What else do we have here? Um, all right. All right. Just some comments there. Um, I think that may be... If you have any questions, folks, once again, just put a cue into the chat there, put your question in, and we will take it. Um, let me see here. There's a, a comment here by Truth Defenders. Scripture confirms history, science, not the other way around. Only because we have an accurate account of what God has done can we trust reality. No, bi no Bible, no account of anything. Um, you want to take I, a I can comment on that? Sure. sure. So, uh, so I, I'm a very staunch evidentialist. I actually don't know where... Tony, you, you stand on the whole. Well, the I'm, I'm, I am presuppositionalist, but I okay. do. I also do believe in in the. Uh, I do believe in evidential argumentation as well. Right. So I am primarily. I mean, I'm reformed. So as, as a Calvinist, I'm. I, I take right. more of the presuppositionalist side, but I don't. Uh, I don't toss out evidentialism. I think uh, our evidentialism is 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 still important. I think there's a biblical grounding for it. And R.C. Sproul, of course, even though he was a well-known Calvinist, was also a very strong evidentialist. And I, I'm also a, a, at least inclined towards the Calvinist, yeah. Calvinistic view. Um, but I, I would be... Uh, that's the biblical view, but go ahead, yeah. <laughs> of course. <laughs> right, so, I, but yeah, I, this might be the only point then that we actually yeah. disagree. Um, yeah. So I'll, I'll just give my two cents on this and feel free to come back and give your perspective if you wish. Uh, but I, I think that the Vantillian... Uh, epistemology of presuppositionalism, which of course was pioneered by Cornelius Van Til and then developed subsequently by Greg Bonson uh, mm -hmm. of Westminster Theological Seminary. Uh, much more articulate el and eloquent writer, I think, than Van Til, much clearer, certainly. And uh, and then, of course, it's championed today uh, in contemporary discourse, people like Scott Oliphant. Uh, and there's, of course, different flavors of presuppositionalism. There's people like John Frame and, and yeah. Bert Oitheris and so forth. But um, the, uh, the, the Basically, presuppositionalism argues that uh, um, unless you start with re um, biblical revelation, then you 
you don't have the necessary preconditions for logic and rationality and reason and so forth. And, um, and so the presuppositionalist argues that you have to begin with the Bible as the ultimate authority. And if you had anything over and above that to which you might appeal, then that would be your ultimate authority. And so um, the, um, the presuppositionalist basically argues that the unbeliever knows that God exists and that he is in this active um, suppression of what he knows of right, to be true right. about God. And the presuppositionalist is trying to bring to his attention that he, in fact, knows God because he has to draw upon biblical uh, precepts, biblical principles in order to make his case. That's essentially how a presuppositionalist would argue. And I think that a presuppositionalist would recognize that as a fair description of what they would argue. Now, what I, where I part company from the presuppositionalist is that I, I have a concern that this mode of argumentation is circular. And I know that presuppositionalists have responded to this. Um, right. Now, when, when you press a presuppositionalist on this charge of circular reasoning, what the way they typically respond is to say, well, everyone has to reason in a circle. There has to be some level of self-referential appeal. For instance, how do you justify deduction without utilizing deduction to do so? And I think right. here that the presuppositionalist um, basically equivocates between two sorts of presuppositions, presuppositions involving analytically true statements versus those involving content. So for instance, take the statement that all bachelors are unmarried. Do I have to go and start interviewing bachelors to find out how many of them are married or not? Well, no, I just need to analyze the constituent terms. And I think that propositions like A is not non-A and two plus two equals four are true in that sense. We know that A is not non-A by virtue of what we mean by A, what we mean by non-A. We know that right. two plus two equals four by virtue of what we mean by this, the terms two plus equals and four, right? Whereas um, the statement that uh, Christianity is true or that God has revealed himself uh, through the person of Christ in, in biblical revelation, that these sorts of statements are more akin to a statement like all bachelors are unhappy. Well, that might be true, but it also might be false. Uh, we can't just analyze the constituent terms to discover whether that's true or not. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that uh, it's a mistake to you know, begin with the biblical text. It seems to me to be arbitrary. Another related concern is that the presuppositionalist rarely gives, um, uh, is rarely able to answer the question of what is the minimal set of propositions that are a necessary precondition for rationality and logic. For example, um, if you didn't have the Trinity or you didn't have the virgin birth or, or, or if uh, the book of Malachi were removed from the canon, what, what is the minimum set of preconditions? And mm -hmm. I, I never really see a, a presuppositional respond to this. Another problem is that um, the, it's what I call the progressive revelation problem, which is to say, imagine that you're a first century Jew living at the time the New Testament is being written and you have a Christian come over to you uh, and try to preach the gospel to you. And you uh, want to know what was the evidence that Jesus really does fulfill those Old Testament prophecies? Was he really born in Bethlehem? Did he, did he really, you know, was he really raised from the dead and so forth? Mm -hmm. And you wouldn't think much if the, you wouldn't think much of the Christian's response if you said, well, actually, um, Jesus of Nazareth as the promised Messiah is a necessary precondition for, for logic and rationality. And you're like, well, what? I mean, this is a new, new information. Mm -hmm. So uh, th these and other problems, I think, really, um, make me concerned about the whole presuppositionalist epistemology. I, I think that evidentialism is, an, is a necessary, is, is just a natural consequence mm -hmm. of consistently not engaging in circular reasoning. But feel free, Tony, if you want to come back at that. And yeah, no, yeah. I mean, I, like I said, I, I, I am primarily presuppositional in my, in my approach. Uh, I don't think there's anything you said that I would, would disagree with. I, I think that, um, I mean, in order for us to, uh, have any conversation. I mean, we need to presuppose logic. I mean, we need to presuppose certain certain verities and so forth. And I and I think we would both agree that these are rooted in God. Logic itself is rooted in God. But uh, I what I don't do is I, I don't simply say, well, it's 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 either presuppositional or evidentialist, and and we'll just throw out evidentialism. I, I do see First Corinthians 15 is a very powerful passage where Paul does point to evidences for the resurrection. Uh, pointing to the witnesses uh, for the resurrection. 
Uh, and so in my apologetic work, uh, Jonathan, I, I've, I've utilized both. And, uh, and so um, I think that they're, they're both very helpful tools. I don't think they're contradictory. Uh, I think it's how we frame those questions. Um, but, but personally speaking, I, in my debates, uh, I've used both. Uh, so especially when dealing with the resurrection, you know, we deal with with uh, the some of the things you enumerated, Jonathan, about the the women witnesses and the the prominence of Sunday, uh, a day that has no religious significance whatsoever in Judaism, other other than if a feast day fell on it, um, and also of course the uh, the the strong evidence, the multiple attestation for the death of Jesus, the the, the empty tomb, and so forth and so on. So. Uh, I wouldn't really be a- adverse to any of those things. I think that they're very important, and I found them uh, very, uh, very helpful as well. Yeah. Um, okay, so let me see. Um, I don't know if there's any other questions. Uh, I, I did have, a, <laughs> I did have a question here about: Are you sure you weren't a hockey player? No, uh, I've never been a. <laughs> I, I, I guess because I live in Canada, Jonathan. You know, Canadians. Uh, you know, we created we created hockey, um, and uh, and of course the home of the Toronto Maple Leafs. So no, no, uh, Harry, I'll, uh, I I I'm very sure I was I'm not a hockey player, although the last time the Toronto Maple Leafs won the Stanley Cup was when I was born in 1967, and since then they've never won the cup. That's that's the best I I, I give you right now. Um, okay, uh, I don't see any other questions. Um, so, Jonathan, is there anything you could leave us with? Uh, I think this is a this is a very important uh, ministry that you're engaged in. Um, and is there any lasting words you'd like to to give our give our uh, our viewers? And um, and if they have friends, and I'm sure you, that they may have friends who uh, are struggling uh, with with these types of questions. Um, so, is there any any words you can give us? Sure. So, if any of you in the audience uh, know of anyone that is struggling with doubts in regards to Christianity, even perhaps a family member or your child or, or what have you. Uh, we do talk to parents as well. If, you, if you're if you a parent uh, and you, you have a, have a son or a daughter that's walked away from the Christian faith, feel free to reach out to us as well. We do talk to parents. We also talk to pastors and we keep people's you know, information completely confidential. Uh, but if you're a full-time in full-time Christian ministry or a pastor, which is a very difficult situation to be in, then please feel free to get in touch if you are struggling with uh, doubts yourself. Um, if, uh, yeah, and we, as I said, we have specialists um, on all kinds of topics. So uh, you can uh, have a high level of confidence that if, if you've got a doubt about a particular area, we'll have someone on our team that is a specialist in that area and we'll be able to you know, do a private call with you to walk you through that. We not only help people to uh, answer their specific questions, we also help people to develop a protocol for working through doubts in an intellectually responsible and honest and healthy way, uh, such as the principles I laid down earlier uh, about drawing appropriate distinctions between questions and objections and so forth. So um, yeah, please uh, feel free to, to get in contact and we'd love to hear from you and uh, um, and uh, also add you to our, our, Discord, our growing Discord community of uh, past inquirers. And uh, yeah, so please get in touch, talkaboutdoubts.com. Yeah, so folks, I would really encourage you to do that um, because there, there, there isn't that many ministries I know that do what Jonathan is doing. Uh, I mean, yes, you have cold case Christianity, <clears throat> uh, but but in this particular ministry that Dr. McClatchy has, y- you can get in touch with various people in various disciplines. Um, so it's a unique ministry in that they can find the right person to deal with a, a specific uh, struggle or, or a problem. It could be creation, evolution. It could be science and faith. It could be the resurrection. It could be biblical uh, authenticity and, and reliability and, and, and the manuscripts and so forth and so on. Um, so, so folks, that's why we're here for you. Uh, we're here for you to, to inform you, to let you know that there is help out there. Uh, there, 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 there are resources uh, that are that are provided by qualified men and women who are trained in these areas. Uh, so I would really, really encourage you to do that. Um, and again, Christianity is, is uh, uh, it is a faith that is rooted in history. You, you can't have Christianity without history. Uh, it, it is, it, there's good reasons to believe in the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, there are good reasons to believe that God exists. Uh, theism is much more 
uh, much more um, logical uh, than, than atheism is and, and so forth. So we really would encourage you to, to do that. Don't forget to subscribe as well. We encourage you to subscribe to Dr. McClatchy's uh, uh, channel and his, 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 uh, his website. Uh, he's, he's all over YouTube as well. A lot of his debates are on there on YouTube. Uh, and also with Toronto Apologetics, we encourage you as well to like and subscribe uh, and you'll receive further updates on, on uh, shows like these where we try to uh, tackle uh, some of the, the more pressing issues of our day and, uh, and to give you that assurance that, uh, that Christ indeed is the answer and that God is sovereign over all things. And so I just want to thank you all for joining us tonight. And, and uh, Jonathan, thank you, uh, brother, for, for being on. It, it's, it's always great to hear you. you you've, just, you've got such a wealth uh, of information and, uh, and you're able to concisely address uh, these very deep questions in, in a meaningful way. So thanks, Jonathan. I really appreciate you coming on. Likewise, Tony. Thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate your work as well. Thank you. And I hope to uh, hope to have you on again uh, for a future show. So everyone, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for joining us. We hope you were blessed and um, uh, we, we trust that uh, you were uh, challenged, encouraged. And, uh, and so we hope to see you again, Lord willing, uh, in another episode. So you take care and uh, the Lord bless you and keep you. All the best. Bye for now.